Good day, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another episode of EPOL Experts. Today is episode five. We'll be looking at broiler nutrition and the ins and outs of, of the digestive process and all of that and why we do what we do. Um, today, you're joining myself, Walter Hildebrand, as well as Stefan Jakobs, our national technical manager, um, who's quite the fundi on, on um, the animal feeding side of things. Um, so, yeah, thank you again for all your questions through the week. Please keep those questions coming. We'll be watching our social media platforms and try and answer all of the questions at the end of, uh, of this episode. Um, so, yeah, enjoy the episode and uh, over to you, Stefan. Thank you, Walter, and thanks for the introduction as well. A uh, warm welcome to everybody that's tuned in. We're really happy that you're joining us on this Thursday afternoon. The cold weather, the worst of it is gone. So, yeah, so I hope you, you're all listening intently and you, you'll get some information that, that might be helpful in your business going forward. So, broiler nutrition principles. The idea why we brought it into this discussion is we don't want to make you an expert in terms of broiler nutrition, but it's it's an important part of your business um, as a broiler farmer or as a future broiler farmer. So good to know some of the basic principles and understand what it's all about. Uh, I'll do a part one of this um, presentation. Um, and then after that, Walter will do part two. In part one, I'll mainly focus on, on the design of the feed. Uh, what makes up the feed, why it's important, what's the different components, a bit about feed form, the, the, um, the, the, the processing of the feed and, and, and how it's um, um, packaged. And then when Walter takes over, he'll look into uh, application. So, you know, how do you feed, what, how does face fe feeding work and um, important parts of the, of the broiler um, feeding process. So to start off with, I think, like I said, it's, it's obviously broiler nutrition is a very important part of your business. And the reason is it take, makes up 70% of your farming costs as a broiler farmer. So with that big cost component, you better be sure and comfortable with your feed supplier and trust that what you find in the bag or, or in the delivery truck is going to give the results that you're paying for. A further step that needs to be considered is with your top broiler quality chicks that you, you're getting from your suppliers, they are, are finely tuned animals and they ready for perfect production. Important for you to make sure that you meet the needs of, of those genetic requirements to get the best out of your bird and be profitable. It's very easy to have a feed that's only high in protein or high in energy but what we focus on in EPOL is to have an optimal balance of, of nutrients over the entire spectrum. So whether it's vitamins, minerals, energy, um, amino acids, everything must be in adequate levels and balanced correctly. I think also important, like I said before, that you need to trust your supplier. You need to find a supplier, a feed supplier with a proven track record where the word of mouth is good. So your friends and or, or neighbors or fellow farmers endorses the product and they're happy with performance and that it's not a, a, a supplier that comes and goes regularly. So you need somebody that's 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 in, in the feed industry for the long term, that's doing the necessary research and development and that ensures that your broiler get the perfect nutrition. So EPOL as a feed company is well entrenched in all of those areas. And we do provide the perfect balance with broiler feed ranges for the full variety of broiler farming operations. So whether you're doing live birds and you grow them for a long period of time, or you're a, a commercial integrated company that needs to slaughter as quickly as possible and get as many cycles through per year, we've got the answer for you. So if we delve a bit deeper into what is in the bag, I think it, it might be a mystery to some people and they might feel a bit uncertain about what they'll get into the in the bag. But most of all, especially with modern packaging, there's some indication on the bags in terms of what you can find in the bag. So whether it's a broiler starter or a broiler grower or a broiler finisher, at least that puts you on the right track. But most importantly is the label. So each and every single bag has got a, a label with the relevant information that, that you need. And as we discuss through the presentation, you'll also later on understand a bit more why it's important to keep the label after you've opened the bag. 
So my next slide is just a bit of an indication of a normal stock standard um, broiler, uh, feed label on a, on a broiler feed bag. So here you can see on the flip side of the, the label, you'll find the, the brand name as well as the registered company. Um, you'll find further information around the composition of the feed, the ingredients and the feeding recommendations as well as where the feed is manufactured. If I take some points out of that example of a broiler ticket, I think first of all you'll find at the top of the ticket you, sh you should see the company name that's supplying the feed. So in this case it, it's EPO and the, the feed name is uh, Sugar Broiler Starter. Um, so that it already puts you in the right understanding of what the intention of the feed is and also there you'll see it's a crumble, so also what form um, the feed is in. If you look at the class registered, so all feed registered is, is um, re registered under Act 36 as indicated there with a specific um, registration number. So in terms of classes the, in the Act there is different classes of feeds, so whether it's car feeds or pig feeds or broiler feeds, there are specific classes that you need to register your feed in. Um, again, at the back, we, we say we've, we've got your brand identification, just to make sure that, that you do know that it's actually an EPOL product. It's not a, a, a EPOL bag being used to bag off another product, but this label tells you what you find in the bag is an EPOL product. Um, and then also below the, the, the brand name, we've got the legal entities. So, EPOL is part of RCL Foods Limited. When you register your feed, you need to supply your company information for, for legal purposes. So that's that's why that information is on the, on the back. If we like look a bit deeper into the, the label, we will look at the composition. So this composition table reflects all the compulsory nutrients that you register your feed under. So what Act 36 does, they provide a broad guideline of all the different nutrients um, and in certain um, cases minimum or maximum levels. So you can see here uh, protein, lysine, methionine are all having minimum levels, moisture having a maximum level uh, and again you don't want your feed to be too high in moisture so that is why it's governed by a maximum value. The same with fiber and the same with, with calcium. So you, you normally see that the, the the elements or the um, comp components that sitting with a maximum level are ingredients that can be misused in terms of diluting the product. So a cheap calcium source uh, you want to, to govern and say you can only put in a maximum of, of that amount of feed or of, of, of the component. Um, within these bounds, so you can see, let's say for protein there's a minimum of 18 percent or 180 grams per kilogram. It's up to the feeding company to decide where they want to pitch their protein. So you might have a, a registration of 18%, but if the company feels that it's beneficial to give you 19% protein, they can give you 19% as long as they are above the minimum levels or below the maximum level. So again, for moisture, although the maximum is 12, your moisture might actually be 10 or 11%. As you've seen in the previous slide, our first component there that's, that's mentioned is the protein percentage. Um, protein is the second largest component of the, of the diet and also the second most expensive in terms of, of making up your, your feed. Um, also good to know that it's not only the protein that's important but actually the amino acids and I'll explain that a bit later on. Why is protein important? Well, if you're dealing with a broiler, you obviously want meat production and meat is generated from proteins and amino acids. So very important then, and that's why it's also a registered nutrient, that you get the right amount of, of proteins in your, your feed. As you can see, 20 to 25 percent of the broiler's fat-free body com composition is protein, and 20 to 30 percent of total protein is also sitting in the feathers. If you're um, farming for the live broiler market, um, a good feather but it's definitely beneficial and, and that's also important to have then the right amount of amino acids to ensure proper feathering of your birds. So like I said, it's not all about protein, it's also about the amino acids and you've seen on the on the label above, 
we talk about lysine and methionine. So these amino acids consist of the following elements. It's carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, and in some cases sulfur and or phosphorus. So that's the building blocks of amino acids. When you put amino acids together, they form peptides, and a number of peptides forms a specific protein. So a muscle protein, um, for instance, or a cell mem membrane protein, or a feather protein. And these amino acids and peptides then occurs in, in, in different relationships in that specific protein. So there's 22 amino acids um, and they can form complex combinations. And these combinations, like I said, will f can be part of the muscle, a feather, enzymes or any other part of the, the body that requires a protein. So the re I'll speak a bit later about why amino acids are so important and not specifically just root protein. When you talk about amino acids, there are some amino acids that's called essential amino acids. These uh, amino acids need to be supplied through the diet. You won't find it, um, you won't be able to synthesize it in your own body or in a chicken's body. It needs to be supplied via uh, nutrition. Then you've got some amino acids that, that can be synthesized from other substrates. And you've got non-essential amino acids that can be produced by the animal itself or even in us humans. So when we talk about essential amino acids, that's then the amino acids that we have to supply as nutritionists. So it's either coming from normal raw materials, your maize, your sunflower oil cake, your soya oil cake, or it originates from synthetic amino acids that's specifically being produced to supply um, these amino acid requirements. As I said, it's not all about protein. So if you take this battle as and say this is a protein that's made up out of different amino acids. So you have your lysine, and you've got methionine and arginine and threonine and tryptophan. Even though the barrel is there and it's a protein, you need to understand that you need the right amounts of specific amino acids. And it's it's called the ideal protein concept. So this water in this barrel, once it reaches this lysine level, it's going to spill out. And if you can increase the lysine, this battle can take more water. So this is uh, then an, an analogy of how proteins work in the body. So even though you might get a high crude protein value of 20%, but you don't have enough lysine, the chicken just can't do enough with the crude protein. Um, you need that essential lysine to be at the right level to get the full benefit of the protein that's supplied to the chicken. So what we as nutritionists do is we try and balance all amino acids to provide for all the requirements for broilers. Another important factor and where we focus as, as equal as a company is on the digestibility of amino acids. So that is how available this amino acid is for the chicken. So if it's poorly processed raw materials, it means that the amino acids can't be digested and utilized as is, and they might be broken down for energy purposes and not for the purpose that, that you, you're feeding the birds for. So you must make sure that you supply amino acids that's um, available for digestion and select the right raw materials with the right digestibility of the amino acids and make sure that you provide the right relationship between your different amino acids. So whether it's a lysine, a methionine, a threonine, a tryptophan, all those essential amino acids that, that we've mentioned above. The next component, and, and you'll see that it's not specifically mentioned on the, on the label, and it's 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 for a number of reasons, but and some of it is it's difficult and um, not that repeatable to measure energy levels in diet. So how you normally measure energy as a scientist, you take a material, you ignite it, and you see how much energy is um, released from that material. So that's a gross energy that you that you get from the material. But as nutritionists, you're a bit more concerned about how much of the energy that's in the diet is actually available to the chicken. Um, and 
energy is the most expensive component of the diet. Um, you'll see that the higher your nutrient density is in the diet, the more you need to take from high concentration energy sources that's more expensive. So you need more soy oil, uh, that's a much more expensive component than a maize-based um, diet. Um, the efficiency of your utilization, so if you uh, supply all these nutrients, especially proteins, you need to supply enough energy to allow the bird to utilize these components. If you don't do that, then the, the broiler will take some of the protein source to actually supply energy. So that's why it's very important to pitch the correct level of energy in your diets. And then in general, if you're, when you feed animals for production, there's an energy component that goes into maintenance and an energy component that goes into production. So, like I said before, energy is measured in uh, megajoules per kg. So, like I said, if you if you have to ignite a, a specific material, um, there will be a, an amount of megajoules uh, released from that material. So, in broiler nutrition, we normally look at metabolizable energy, um, and that's used to formulate according to the requirements of the birds. Um, over the years, there's been a lot of refinement around uh, metabolizable energy and various corrections and um, refinements uh, in stating it. But I think for the purpose of this presentation, we'll just talk about metabolizable energy. And energy is mainly supplied from carbohydrates, so, so that your starches and your sugars from, let's say, maize and, 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 and wheat and those raw materials, fats and oils and, and, and protein. So, Protein to a lesser extent, but definitely carbohydrates, fats and oils form the biggest part of your energy. As you remember from the slide, a couple of slides ago when we looked at the composition, there is a fiber component and there's a fat component. So although energy is not specifically stated, there is some statements around fibers and fats that make up energy in the diet. If we further break down energy, like I mentioned, there's a maintenance requirement and there's a production requirement. Maintenance requirements is split into basal metabolism. So that is your normal, if you're sitting still, you're just breathing, you're keeping um, still, that's, that's what you, your digestion is happening. You, your normal body processes are happening without any activity. That is your basal metabolism. Then you've got adaptive thermogenesis. So if you're sitting in your room and you're a bit cold, you're going to use energy to stay warm. So you'll either start shivering or your body will, will burn more energy just to stay warm. And then further under maintenance requirements is physical activity. So if you're a broiler, you need some energy to at least walk to the feeder trough or to the um, drinker to, to get water and for normal um, activity. If we do look at production requirements, then there's energy required to build muscle, to form eggs if, you're, uh, if you've got layer birds, and again also for, for thermogenesis as explained above. Another item you, you saw in the composition is, is minerals, and specifically calcium and phosphorus. So that you will remember that there was a maximum level for calcium and a minimum level for calcium, um, and then also a minimum level for phosphorus. So these two minerals are the single most important macro minerals. Um, uh, the skeleton of your broiler contains about 90%, 99% of the calcium in the body and 80% of the phosphorus. So it's therefore crucial that you have the right amount and the right relationship of calcium and phosphorus. You need it for leg, health and for skeletal development. As you know, if you have leg problems in your broilers, they can't feed normally and they can't drink normally and you're also not getting a good market price for them when you try to sell them. So some of the sources where we get um, calcium from is, is limestone powder and we get phosphorus from monocalcium phosphate and there's also a natural occurrence of both these minerals in the raw materials that's contained in your diet. So like I said before, the level is important, but also the ratio. So you need the right amount of calcium versus the right amount of phosphorus. And then more, also very important, you've got vitamin D 
that plays a vital role in, in bone formation and works together with the calcium and phosphorus. So we've now dealt with most of the composition part of the of the of the label. If you go a bit further down, you'll see this ingredient statement. So this is just a broad list of all the raw materials that might occur in in your feed. So it's not necessarily there, but from time to time, it's likely that you'll get these raw materials. So if you look at grain and grape, grain rye products um, and animal protein products, plant protein products, oils and fats, these are all essential raw materials that nutritionists use to get to your, your final feed. Um, so important for you as a customer to know what you can find in your feed and um, what are the raw materials that, that make up your feed. There's also a part that deals with the additives like amino acids, minerals and vitamins. And if there's any stock remedies like oxidiostates or, or growth promoters. If you go a bit further down on the label, you'll see there's feeding recommendations. So obviously it tells you how much and when to feed this to your broiler. There's a production date and a best before date that's also regulated by Act 36. And then very important is your batch number. As I said before, you need to retain your, your bag label once you've opened the bag. So you'll take that batch number and if you have a problem with your feed, that is a unique number that links back to the manufacturing process in the factory. So if you've got a complaint or a concern about a specific um, bag product or a batch of feed, you can use that batch number and tell your technical advisor or the feed mill involved that you're worried about for some reason about this feed. They can then use that number and trace back to the actual mixing and production of that specific batch and feed or feed. They can um, collect all the data re re with regards to the quality test that was performed on it and also the raw materials that was used to, to produce it. So it's a very effective way to follow up on any concerns you have with a specific batch of feed. If we look look at the, the next category, that's the vitamins. Um, so vitamins are essential dietary factors that's required in small amounts to make any human, animal, insect, bird body work normally. They divide it into two groups, the fat soluble vitamins, and that's the vitamin A, D, E and K. So they the first line of defense um, especially vitamin A when it comes, and it's also important when it comes to development and repair of skin or um, the inside of the mouth or anything that's, that's, that's in direct contact with the environment. Um, so the fat soluble vitamins just means that they can be stored in the body. So in other words, if there's fat in your body, you will find vitamin A, D, E and K stored in the fat. Um, if you look at vitamin D, it's important for absorption of calcium and phosphorus. As I mentioned before, it plays a crucial role again with normal skeletal development and, and, and growth. And as you know, if your leg health and skeletal development is good, the frame is there for the bird to, to grow and perform. Um, another important fat soluble vitamin is vitamin E. It's important for cell productivity and blood formation. And then you, you find vitamin K, which is important for blood clotting. So in other words, if there's any, any injury or a bump or anything for the bird, that normal blood clotting can occur. So normally you'll find these um, vitamins included in the vitamin and mineral premix pack that you find in your feed. The water soluble vitamins are not necessarily stored in the body. So they almost, as, as they consume, they're being used in the body. Um, and they play a role in a lot of normal body functions. Vitamin B1, for instance, um, is also called uh, theamine. It stimulates intake and has a role in the formation of digestion enzymes. You find vitamin T, B2, um, that's important for body processes, so like growth and oxidation. I've just here selected an, a few vitamins um, that I feel that's important in terms of broiler nutrition for growth and development. Then you have niacin that's important for me metabolism of energy and protein and vitamin B6 um, again playing a role in carbohydrate and fat met metabolism so the digestion and uptake of 
fats and sugars and starches. And then important vitamin C, um, it helps with to alleviate stress and um, provide support to immune function. So like you remember vitamin A is also a line of, um, of, of, of defense against um, external factors where vitamin C is more internally playing a role in terms of uh, immune function. Um, we've touched on a couple of macro minerals above, the calcium and the phosphorus, but there's also a few others, and they form an integral part of all body tissues. Um, and again, they're a small part of the diet, but they are vital. So the, the two further ones that I want to discuss is sodium and chloride, and together they form um, your navel, normal table salt. Um, we do supply it in the diet via salt, um, and it's important to get that level correct. Um, salt is a natural intake stimulant, um, and it, if, if you don't put enough salt in, you'll see reduced intakes. If you put too much salt in, you'll get uh, overconsumption of water and you'll see wet litter um, becoming a problem in your house. Uh, the then another one is potassium. It also works together with sodium and chloride in, in normal cell functions. Um, in general, you don't see deficiency with the diets that we formulate, and it's not necessarily um, supplied as a supplement in the in the diet. So, the the, the, the diet by itself provides enough um, potassium for the bird to perform. I think another important part in the calcium and phosphorus interaction, and the vitamin D, as we discussed before, is magnesium. Um, very important for bone formation, um, and we can't stress enough how the balance between calcium, phosphorus, vitamin D, and magnesium ensures the successful um, skeletal development, especially of our fast-growing broilers. If we look at our trace minerals or micro minerals, as they might be called, um, again, there's 11 of them that's important. I've just selected a couple here for the purpose of this um, presentation. Um, zinc works together with, um, with vitamin A. It also helps with enzyme function, again with the normal digestion and uptake processes to do with proteins and carbohydrates and with immune response. Um, copper and, and iron plays a role with red blood cells and red blood cells inter is a carrier of oxygen. So as we all know, for any living being, um, whether you're an athlete, or you want to perform, you need enough oxygen. So if you've got the right um, amount of red blood cells and healthy red blood cells, um, your bird is going to perform. Next come the selenium. Um, selenium interacts with vitamin E, and it's essential for a number of enzyme systems. In, in, in breeder birds or birds that, that, that needs to lay um, eggs that needs to hatch, it's also important for, for fertility and, and hatchability, but for broilers, it's more um, important for certain enzyme systems. As with calcium, phosphorus, vitamin D and magnesium, manganese also plays an important role in bone formation. And then the last um, micromineral I want to um, talk about is, is iodine. It's a component of thyroxine and that comes from your thyroid and that controls a number of body functions. So normally you find enough iodine in, in, in your table salt. It's a natural occurring part of table salt, but in certain cases it might be supplemented. The next category of ingredient that I would like to look at is, is additives, is the, is the ad enzymes. Um, so these are phytases, proteases, and xylanases. So, Phytase is an enzyme that is widely used. Um, you find phosphorus in raw materials that's bound in a structure, and those structures doesn't make the phosphorus that available. So by using phytase, you break up the structure and you make the phosphorus available um, for consumption. I think if you look at this little diagram here, you can see the enzyme and the substrate. So in that substrate, you see the phosphorus. Once it combines with the substrate, that blue dot now becomes available. And, um, and as an analogy, that is then the phosphorus, and that can be utilized by the bird. So you can see that the enzyme combines with, 
with the with the substrate, whether it's um, a raw material or a, a specific nutrient, and it makes it more available by interacting with the with the substrate. So the reason for why phytase is so widely used, it, it reduces the use of inorganic and very expensive phosphorus, um, because with the use of it, you get most of the um, phosphorus supply from from your natural occurring raw materials. Um, and the other benefit, added benefit of phytase, it also releases um, a wide spectrum of other nutrients that was part of that um, bonded formation I referred to earlier. Another widely used enzyme is, is proteases. As it says, it's got to do with protein metabolism, so it helps with the digestibility of proteins and amino acids. And it's specifically effective when you deal with Ipro soya or sunflower oil cakes, so all the plant based protein sources in your diet. Uh, another um, enzyme that we use on a regular basis is xylanase. So that improves the digestibility of non starch polysaccharides. So it's a very big and complex word, but it actually just talks about the complex carbohydrates. So it's not a starch or a sugar, it's a bit more a complex structure that's not that easily digestible by the bird. So by adding the xylanase, you make these carbohydrates also available for the broiler. Uh, the next one we want to discuss is growth promoters or AGP. So we call it antibiotic growth promoters. I think very important here to just make it very clear that in the chicken industry, contrary to popular belief, there is no growth hormones being used. Um, we use antibiotic growth promoters um, selectively and they work on the digestive tract and more specifically the, the small bacteria that's present in the, the digestive tract. They exclude or negate the negative bacteria that's present in the gut and allow the better um, bacteria that helps with the normal digestion and gut health of the bird to, to perform and to, to compete. So as a consequence, by adding the, the AGPs or antibiotic growth promoters, you get improved growth and performance. And in other words, the, the nutrients that the bird takes in can be properly utilized. You've got the right bacteria that can break them further down for digestion. And some research has shown that without an AGP at 42 days, you lose about 50 grams of, of, um, of weight. Um, and the range can be anything between 0 and 150. So depending on, on the environment um, that the bird um, lives in, it can be almost zero if there's no bacterial challenges or 150 when it's specifically a um, bad environment. You also um, leave, lose out on, on, on um, feed conversion ratio. So in other words, if you don't use the, the AGPs, your bird um, will need more feed to put on the same amount of, of, of kilogram life weight. There's also a small um, impact on mortality, but I think it's negligible for, for the purpose of this discussion. So just a quick picture to give you guys on, on, on how do you actually know. You've seen the nutrient requirements, you've seen what is needed in the diet, um, you've seen what we use to, to make up the feed, but now you need to bring it all together. So you need to understand that if I've got a batch of maize in my system, what does that maize give me that I can use to be to be formulated into the requirements of a starter feed, a grower feed, a finisher feed for broilers? So what you do with a, with a matrix, it's a table of nutrient content. So for yellow maize, it will be the, the moisture percentage, the amount of protein, the amount of fat, the amount of fiber, the starch, the sugar, and the whole list of, of nutrients that make up maize. And you do that for each and every single um, raw material and they have unique numbers. These values are also not fixed. They do vary from time to time um, and with season. So if it's um, freshly harvested maize, it's normally a bit higher in, in, in moisture than maize that's been stored for a while. Depending on the growing conditions, the protein in maize might be lower 
or higher. So obviously you can understand that if maize only brings 6% of protein instead of 9%, you have to use more of a raw material with a higher protein content. So how we get to matrices, there's some um, published tables that you can use. Um, some of the more refined and bigger companies do their own analysis and EPOL has got its own in-house laboratories with regular samples being sent in to build our matrix and give us a full understanding on an ongoing basis of what each raw material um, is supplying and then ensure that when mixed with the other raw materials, we still reach the same amount of nutrients that we would like to see in the diet. If we go a bit down in terms of, of what raw materials provides what in the diet, and it's not exclusive, so even though we've got energy sources being yellow maize, white maize and wheat, there is also a protein component in yellow maize and in wheat and in omnichop and in wheat bran and in maize jam, but they mainly used grain and grain byproducts as energy sources. The same goes for, for, for fats and oils, so your soy oil, your maize oils, and your blended oils, are all considered important energy sources. I think just to mention here that a lot of work has been done in terms of how fine or coarse you grind your, your raw materials, um, specifically with um, your, your energy sources. So on the one hand, you want to have it fine enough to um, ensure proper digestion and uptake. But if it's again too fine, you get problems with gut health. So it's an important balance to reach and it also plays a role in terms of your, your pellet quality. If we look at some protein sources, so there you see a widely used um, soya oil cake, um, a picture of that. Uh, there you see a picture of a full fat soya. Um, sunflower oil cake, so soya and full fat soya comes from the soya bean. Um, the companies extract oil out of it and sell the oil um, into human consumption or even for animal consumption and the remaining product is a high protein content um, feed. You also have gluten 60 that's a plant-based protein that plays an important role and with all these raw materials it's very important that the processing is 100% right so you don't want it over processed or under processed so there is a cooking process that happens in the um, formation of these um, plant-based um, proteins and if there's too much heat or not enough heat you get damage to the to the raw material and that makes that some of the um, amino acids are not as available or, or as digestible as you um, you planned another source of protein in terms of specific amino acids is synthetic amino acids so some commercially used ones are lysine, methionine, threonine and, and tryptophan and, and as we refine and um, become more scientific and specific about nutrient requirements, this list will grow um, in terms of what we want to supply specifically per bird. I think to, to wrap up the, 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 the specific nutrition part is just to, to talk about water quickly. I called it the ignored nutrient. Um, it's also a very important part of your, your broiler performance and if you don't have the correct water quality, you can do a number of things right, but you're not going to get um, the right performance. So some important considerations, and I think I'm not going to go through the whole list um, for this presentation, but areas that you need to look at or parameters for water quality. And when you start off your farm, probably very good to, to test it before you start farming to just have a good idea of what's the water quality like and then on an ongoing basis but but first set the base for yourself and, and, and measure that against the table like this to understand the, the quality of your water but yeah obviously you don't want bacteria um, in your water um, there is acceptable levels but as a farmer you would like to stay as low as possible or preferably at at zero levels of of, of coliform um, bacteria you want the right ph level um, you want just the right amount of, of, of um, minerals in the water. If you have an oversupply of certain minerals, it's going to interact with your nutrition um, of your, your chicken, and, and that will obviously lead to um, met metabolic problems um, through the, the growing cycle. Um, I think also just to, to wrap up on the water then, um, 
just again, when you do your planning for your broiler housing and for your farm, be sure to understand the amount of, of water you need. So I think from our previous discussions and from your um, feeding recommendations, you'll know what the amount of, of feed a, a bird is going or a broiler is going to eat over its um, life cycle. So when you have an environmental temperature of 20 degrees, the bird is going to eat twice, to drink twice the amount of water than the feed that it's eating. So if you say you're going to use three cages of feed to grow out your bird, you're going to need six liters of water over the life cycle of, of that broiler. Um, important to know that as the temperature increases, this ratio increases with it. So, so if you're in a very warm or hot area of the country, and you don't have environmentally controlled houses, the ratio goes up to five liters of water per one kg of, of feed being used. So just important to, to take note of this, um, because if you don't supply enough water, your intakes goes down and you don't get the performance that you would like to see. Um, I think to wrap up my presentation, I would like to talk about the feed form that you, you'll find your feeding. So in general, in the old days, um, a lot of people still make use of, of, of mesh feed. Um, nowadays, almost every starter feed that you buy on the market will be in a crumble form. Best to have the crumble size between one and three millimeters in di diameter. It might differ, obviously, when you look at the sample, you'll find some finer and some coarser stuff, but as long as the majority of the crumble size is between one and three millimeters, you should get CEC good intakes. Um, when you look at the grower finish and post finisher feeds, that's normally pelleted feeds. And you get also a wide range of, of pellet diameters. Um, I think you'll find from a three millimeters to a five millimeter pellet. And depending on, on your specific application and your preference, broilers can deal with, with that pellet size. So when they go over to a, a grower feed that uh, 15, 16, 17, 18 days of age, they should be able to deal with this, this pellet sizes um, in terms of the, the anatomy and, and ability to take in feed. The benefits of having your feed in a crumbled or a pelleted form is that it, it allows for easy intake. So in other words, if the bird pecks, it pecks a whole pellet of feed instead of pecking a number of times to get all the particles of a, of a, a mesh feed. Um, a direct consequence is that of that is, is reduced wastage. So you can also think if you're just feeding on pellets, there's a lot less spillage and wastage because it's a much cleaner process um, to, to, to take in the feed. There is a degree of processing when you deal with crumbles and pellets. So it goes through a heat and a steam process. So some of the, the starches become more available for digestion by the, by the broiler. It also has the added benefit when you put heat and steam on the diet that you kill off um, and bacteria that's present in the raw materials uh, that also helps to reduce the bacterial load on your farm. Just a quick um, trial to show what happens with poor quality pellets. So in other words, this graph just shows you how as you progress down the graph, so here is everything in the in your back is pellets, the 100% is mesh. So you can see your FCR is at a 1.6 or a 1.5 when you have 100% pellets. And if, if you go to 100% mesh, it almost doubles. So you need almost double the amount of feed to, to reach the same body weight uh, when you have mesh versus pellets. So just to show you the benefit of having a good uh, pellet quality feed. So from my side, thank you very much um, for listening. Uh, we're going to show you a short video now, and then Walter will take us into part two of our discussion. I um, hope that you've got some useful information out of my presentation, and you're welcome to, to um, send through any questions or queries that you would like to add. So thank you very much, and uh, let's go into the video, and then I'll hand over to, to Walter for part two.
Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Stefan, thank you very much for a very informative talk. Um, quite a lot of information to grasp. Um, just on that, if it is slightly overwhelming, that's what we do. We focus on the nutrition side so you don't have to. And like Stefan mentioned, we do the perfect balance. So our main focus is to balance all of the different nutrients and minerals and vitamins in a perfect way so that you uh, so you don't have to worry about that side of things. So you can focus on the management. Um, so yeah, um, I'm going to jump straight into it. What we'll be looking at uh, in my talk today, um, digestive anatomy, phase feeding, basic quality checks. Now the digestive anatomy, I'll just run through it quickly and then phase feeding, I'll just explain the basic principle of it because you can get, get quite technical or in-depth um, and then just some practical uh, basic quality checks that you can look at when you get the feed on the farm. So obviously the first thing about a chicken is chicken don't have teeth. Now I'll explain a bit more in detail about that later. So chicken... Chickens pick at something and they just swallow it. It gets swallowed through the esophagus and the main function of the esophagus is to transport and moisten the feed. Next, the crop. Main function is storage, but it also has a moistening effect of the feed. Um, and you need that moistening, so the, the liquid in it, that some of the enzymes are actually activated by moisture. Um, so you actually do need the, the, the feed to, to get a little bit wet. And again, because chickens don't chew like humans do, you don't get that mastication effect that, uh, that you get uh, in, in a mouth that chews. Just something interesting, um, what they found in studies is that ad lib feeding um, has to affect that the crop actually diminishes in size. Um, not initially when they're young, but as they get older, and it's just logic because it's used for storage. If they've got ad lib feeding, they don't need to bulk feed and then store it for later. They can actually just keep on feeding as as uh, as the day goes on. Um, but that's just more for interest's sake. The next thing is the proventriculus. Now the proventriculus and the gizzard. Um, work together um, in the grinding process. So both of them are part of the grinding process. Um, as I explained, chickens don't have teeth, so the feed needs to be ground some other way, and that's where the proventriculus and the gizzard come in. But the proventriculus' main function is to secrete enzymes like um, hydrochloric acid as well as pepsinogen, and these just break down the feed into smaller particles um, and easier manageable um, portion sizes so that the small intestines can digest it further. Uh, um, and it also, the, this is where the, the pH of the food starts dropping, and it can drop from 4 pH 4 to anything as low as 2, 2.5. Um, so that's the main function of the proventriculus. And then, like I mentioned, the gizzard. The main function of the gizzard is grinding of the feed. So it's got a, it's got a, a, a hard, um, a hard call it shell on the inside, but it's not really what it is. It's just the inside of it is very sandpapery. So it feels like sandpaper when you actually um, get the gizzard and you can feel it on the inside. It's very sandpapery. And what actually happens is the food gets gets um, contracted. So the gizzard is a, a muscle stomach. So very similar to human stomach, but it's got a lot of muscle. And then it actually contracts and push the feed back into the proventriculus and the proventriculus then back into the gizzard. And so it goes to and fro until the feed is fine enough so that it can pass into the small intestines. Um, Stefan mentioned about, about feed form and also the coarse maize, coarse versus fine maize and the advantages of each. Um, this is specifically where it, it, it makes a big difference. So coarse maize has a, has a, a great effect on, on um, gastrointestinal health, um, which also helps the birds to perform better. Um, again, that gizzard, this is where the coarse maize comes in. All right. And then the small intestines. Now, this is where your pancre pancreas um, actually um, deposits all, all of those enzymes that come from there, as well as the gallbladder um, with the gall that comes in and helps with fat digestion. Um, so main function of the small intestine, which consists of the duodenum, eugenum, and ileum, is to digest the feed into its smaller particles. So um, all the starches get broken down, sugars get broken down, um, proteins get broken down into amino acids, and then they get um, absorbed throughout the small intestines. Um, and that is obviously very important to, to extract the minerals and the vitamins and the nutrients from the feed. And this is actually where that happens. Um, again, if your, your gut health is good, 
it happens effectively, your bird grows brilliantly, um, which makes you more profitable, and that's where you want to be going. Um, I just need to mention that as well. Um, Stefan mentioned the AGPs, um, and I just want to reiterate what he said is we don't put growth hormones into chicken feed. You don't actually need to. They might explode, I think, if you put in growth hormones. So we don't need to put in the genetics are just that good that you actually just need to supply them with the right feed. Um, the AGP or the antibiotic growth promoter um, that we put in, the main function of that is to keep the bird in a constant state of being healthy. So to up that bird's health, because the healthier it is, the less energy and um, time is spent on immune response and the more gets put into growth and, um, and weight gain. So just very important to remember on that side. And then um, the seeker. So this is where fermentation of undigested feed happens. Now, something that they have found is um, feeds that are in a, that have got high fiber in them um, does tend to have to affect that the seeker is a lot bigger um, than than in birds with lower fiber diets. Um, so it does play a role in fiber digestion as well and fiber fermentation. Um, but a big function of this um, of the seeker is absorption of water and electrolytes as well as those water soluble. Um, vitamins that Stefan mentioned. Very important. This is this is a point where, where vitamin B and such get uh, get absorbed. Um, then the colon um, or the large intestine. Um, also, yeah, also very important for water absorption. Um, but the colon, even though it gets called the large intestine. It's actually a lot smaller than the small intestine when you talk about length. Um, it's just because usually it's slightly thicker, especially in, in humans. Um, but but with chickens, um, it's not really a lot larger than the small intestine. But main function, water absorption. Obviously, all of that moisture that gets put in with the esophagus and the crop and part of the enzymes need to, needs to be extracted. Otherwise, the birds will dehydrate really quickly. Um, so water absorption happens here. And then also it minimizes the waste. So the more water that gets absorbed, the firmer the waste. Um, so you don't have massive amounts of wet litter and whatever coming out. Um, and then the last is the cloaca, which then goes into the vent. Um, this is where your urinary and digestive waste, waste gets combined. Now in humans, you've got, you've got your rectum and your bladder and those then excrete the different components, so urine and feces separately. With chickens, you don't have that separately. They get combined, um, and that then comes out together. Um, so, and that's where it happens is in the cloaca, and it, it, the excretion happens through the vent. It's the same point of entry for reproduction when you, obviously in broilers, you're not looking at reproduction, but with broiler breeders or for chickens as a whole, this is a point of entry for, for reproduction. So quickly what I wanted to do is phase feeding. I'm going to just explain it very basically and just run over at high level just so that I can, I hope you'll grasp the concept of that. Um, so the first thing is you'll see in a lot of the feed, the protein in each phase actually comes down. Now that's the crude protein um, and your, your amino acid balance also changes, but it's very complex. So the reason why this happens is, and it's the same concept, I'll put this up on the energy side as well. So your energy actually increases um, as the birds or as you move into the phases. Now, I've put here the five-phase diets, which is your big, big commercial farms use five-phase diets. Um, in the smaller farms, we don't do the five-phase diets. You try and keep the phases as few as possible just because of your quantity. So otherwise, you're going to be feeding five kgs of the one and 10 kgs of the other and then it, it starts getting it just gets too much um but but the principle in this is that you need that high protein and the minerals and vitamin packs are also actually a lot higher in the the pre-starter um firstly because your your pre-starter goes to a chick that eats very little so you need a high concentrated diet but you don't need all that energy because the chick is still brooding so it gets external heat, so it doesn't need all that body um, heat regulation, all of that. Um, and also, this is the point of skeletal growth. So calcium and phosphorus is quite high in the pre-starter and starter because you're setting that frame. You're setting the basis on which you're going to build your, your call it your muscle mass or your meat or whatever. Um, so very important. Um, and then also, 
if you, so just to give you extremes on that, if you started off with a starter and you just kept going with a starter all the way through, then you would be wasting your in uh, your proteins and your amino acids and um, and you would not be getting enough energy. Even though the chicken would eat a lot more as they get older, um, you wouldn't be able to get enough energy and you won't get the optimal growth. Same principle, if you start with, for example, a finisher and go all the way through, you won't have enough nutrients um, for nutrients, aka protein, amino acids, but let's just call it nutrients, um, for the bird to actually optimally grow like they should through the phases um so so it is very important to at least do a a starter so what we do in some of our feeds a lot of companies do a starter grow a finisher and then maybe a post finisher um in some of our feeds we do a start to finish a post so in maritzburg we do it that way um but the point is you need to have a starter which focuses on that initial growth um high concentration um, and then a, a feed that you can feed later on that's got high in energy for the bird to actually lay down that muscle and and uh, meat that you want it from the growth point of view. Um, also, an important thing, yeah, like Stefan mentioned, is a feed form. So starters usually come in crumble, whereas growers and finishers usually come in pellets. Um, also, if you feed a pellet to a chick that's too young, they scratch it out, you get a big uh, feed wastage, and you also um, don't get optimal growth because they spend a lot of time and energy um, actually scratching around looking for the right size uh, pellets. And then vice versa, when the crumbles are too small, the intakes are not not uh, quick and fast enough to, uh, to get that necessary growth to get the good FCRs like on the finisher. So just a, a side note on that. Then just to go over to the quality checks quickly. So I'm gonna break it up into before and after opening the bag. So when you get your feed, have a look at the feed. Check, is it the correct feed? Is the bag tag say the correct feed that you are looking for and that you've ordered or that you wanted? So just double check that because it's a lot easier exchanging feed when you haven't opened it yet than it is to, to exchange it when, it, uh, yeah, when it's already open. Best before date, date of manufacture, just have a look at that. Stefan did uh, show you where on the bag tags those are, but they're usually slightly at the bottom. Um, and then make sure that the bag's dry. If it feels wet on the outside already, the chances are good that your, your um, content's also gotten wet, um, and that will cause mold and a whole lot of other things that you don't want, so, so um, mold growth and spores, and that causes disease in the chickens. Um, another thing to feel for, and that is usually when the bags have gotten wet and they got dry, is if you feel clumps and lumps. So feel the bag, feel the pellets. Um, if you feel big chunks of feed on the inside, the chances are good that that's probably moldy feed that's gotten wet and that's dried off again. Um, don't feed that. Set, keep that bag closed, send it back to wherever you got it from and ask for a, for a exchange. And then also, does the bag look old or dusty? Now, some of these bags, you might lose a bit of color on it, so don't worry too much about it, especially if the best before date or the date of manufacture is not, you're not close to the best before date, um, but just have a look at it, because if the bags have been standing in sun, for example, um, then you will get, then the, it does go, it does fade, um, and that's not a good thing. You don't want the bags to stand in the sun. Um, the feed goes off quicker, you lose uh, efficiency of the feed. Then after opening the bag, so this is using your eyes, nose, mouth. You don't have to listen too much. You don't worry too much about your ears. Um, but firstly, look at the feed. When you've opened it, does it look fresh? Is there any mold or flour mite? Now, when I say flour mite, we refer to something like we call it walking dust. So it literally looks like fine maize particles or yellow like dust that actually moves. So if you put it down on a white piece of paper, you'll see it actually moves. That's flower mite. Now, they won't do anything bad to, to, your, uh, to your animals, um, but it's usually a, a sign of older feed or infested feed, and that feed's also going to infest any other feed that you've got um, on the farm. So preferably keep that one side and uh, send it back to where you got it from, ask for an exchange. Um, most factories actually won't take back feed that's got flour mite as in it because it infests the other feed that's in there. So um, they'll probably just exchange it for you. Um, then use your nose. How does the feed smell? Does it smell nice and mazy and fresh or does it smell rancid or have any other strange smell? So again, 
if it's gotten wet, you'll find a moldy smell, a typical moldy smell. But um, you can also get that the, the, the oils and the fats have gone off. Now, that's just something that happens over time. And then you get a rancid smell. Both of those mean that the chickens probably won't like eating it. They are quite, quite finicky when it comes to the food. And then the last thing is you can taste the feed. Look, it's not unsafe. I wouldn't eat a whole plate of feed, but if you taste one or two pellets and it tastes fresh, that's fine. I don't think that'll be too much of a problem, but just something on that. If if you can answer yes to all of these and they all fresh and look fresh and taste fresh, the chickens will probably also say yes, please, and thank you for that. Um, they, they are... They, they like eating. They were built for eating, especially broilers. That's what they were genetically modified for, so um, or genetically selected for, I should rather say. Um, so, but check the feed, and if you're happy with it and it doesn't smell or taste funny to you, it probably won't to them as well. And something to mention here is, um, like Stefan mentioned, the salt content as well. Um, if there's too little salt, you're going to struggle. But if there's way too much salt, you'll probably taste it as well. So just for, for interest sake on that. All right. Well, that's all from me today. Um, please send through your, your questions that you might have. Um, and we'll try and answer as many of them as we can. We've received some through the week as well, which we'll deal with after the short break. Um, so please stay with us. We'll just take a quick short break and then we'll be back with our question and answer session. Thanks so much. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us again for the Q&A. Um, I am um, with Stefan. We'll quickly run through some of these questions and try and answer them into it. The first question is from Tobisi, um, and we had a similar question from Mpo, so we'll just deal with, with this one, which is similar, and then Stefan will answer both of them like that. Um, so the question is, what is the right way of changing diet for broilers moving from starter to grower to finisher? Do I gradually introduce or can I change the diet 100% in a day? Stefan, what do you think? So basically, thanks for that question. I, I think a very good question and a very pertinent question. Um, you obviously know a lot about um, animal um, livestock and, and how to, to deal with them. I think... Um, if you look at, at broilers, they may be a slightly bit different from, from other animals in that two things is important. The one is when you're feeding your broiler, you tend to have feed available all the time. So in other words, the feeder pans or the troughs are always full. So when you change from the one diet to the other, from a starter to a grower or a grower to a finisher, there is already a little bit of starter in when you put growing. So you'll get a natural mixing of feed. So there is anyway sort of a gradual change um, between the diets. I think the second important part is that when we formulate diets as nutritionists, we try and use the same type of raw materials 
in the different phases. So you might use a, a bit a little bit less maize in a um, in a starter than in a grower, and in a grower than in a finisher. But it's you use yellow maize in all the phases, or you use sunflower oil cake or soya oil cake in all the phases. So in other words, the gut health of the animal or the gut stability of the animal, so the, the uh, microflora or bacteria that's already in the gut of the animal is used to those raw materials. So that's why it's not that important to do a, a gradual phasing in. You can just change the diet 100% from uh, you know the, the one day to the next. I hope you we answered that question of you to be seen. I think the next question Walter can um, can handle for us, and I'll just quickly get to it. So from Kartu, we've got a question about his chicks not growing. Um, they're already four weeks old, and, and he's not seeing any progress. And he's asking for any advice of, of what might be the reason for it. Walter, any thoughts from your side on, on this question? Thank you, Stefan. Um, yeah, look, I mean. As you know, Stefan, this can be pretty much anything. Um, it's very difficult to say from 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 this point of view. Um, my first question would be: Is uh, chick quality? What what was the, what were the chicks looking like when you got them? Second thing is: What are you feeding them, and how much are they getting fed? Um, third thing, maybe water. Look at your water quality. Look at your water quantity. Do they always have access to water, or is there times that they run out of water? Um, your heating in the house, um, have your temperatures been been like they should have been throughout the time? Um, and then something maybe I can, can just suggest is have a look at your birds. Go sit in there for half an hour or so and have a look at what are they doing. Are they running around and eating and drinking or are they just sitting and not doing much? Um, it depends on what your brooder looked like as well or the what, what you used um, and what you controlled your heat with. Um, was your was all the gases that that produce was produced were they removed uh, sufficiently? Um, is your ventilation good enough? Um, so are you getting fresh air in there? Um, but I think all of those things you can actually go sit in the house and as you walk in, what's the first um, thing that you smell or feel when you walk in? Um, is there anything that that smacks you in the face that says, oh, this is not nice? Um, because again, if it's something that that bothers you, it's probably going to bother the chicks. And then lastly, maybe from a from a disease or a viral point of view, um, I don't know how your mortalities are looking. Have you had a lot of mortalities or is it, is it that they're just not growing? Um, again, something to also look at is, um, I mentioned chick quality in the beginning, but what chicks are you using? Are you using the, the Arbor Acre Cobb Ross chicks or have you got a different breed that, you, that you're that you using? Um, a while ago, I had a guy who asked me the same question, but he was actually, he actually got layer chicks from someone um, and they tend to grow a lot slower. Even with, with good quality feed, they tend to grow a lot slower. Um, so yeah, my, my, my advice would actually be to maybe contact contact one of our mills or contact your closest TA, um, explain the whole situation. You're welcome to contact myself or Stefan as well. Um, explain your whole situation so we can ask you specific questions of what you're seeing and what you're experiencing um, and then maybe go from there instead of trying to sort of guess what could be, what could be the problem. I don't know, Stefan, anything from your side? Walter, I think you've you've covered everything there. I think you know it's 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 all about the environment that the birds are in. If if that's conducive to growth, um, you know they'll grow. And if 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 they they've got the right intake of feed, so um, God is not saying anything about um, mortality or, or high mortality. A lot of chicks dying. So so it seems to be ruling out the specific disease problem. Um, but I think, like you said, you know, just look at the environment and look at the intakes. Um, and and um, if you can, you know, send some photos or some info, further information to your TA or, or to any one of us and we can, can try and assist you. All right, brilliant. Thank you, Stefan. Um, then the third question is from Mishaya. Um, question is, what are the performance factors that one needs to consider when deciding on when to start selling your broilers? Stefan, would you like to start? Yeah, I think um, 
Thanks again for your question, Mashaya. Um, I'll try and answer it if, just to make sure that my understanding is correct also of your question. But the question is, when do you want to start marketing your, your chicken? So obviously, first of all, the question is, who's your target market? Um, you can market your broilers basically any day from 32 days to, to um, 46 days or, or even older. Uh, I think important factors to consider as your bird gets older, it needs more um, feed to put on the same uh, um, um, amount of weight. So your, your feed conversion ratio does become bigger or larger. So it's just the natural um, uh, phenomenon as the bird grows that, that it needs more feed the older it gets. So that's the first one to consider. I think the next one to consider is uh, what is your, your cost that you incur for your feed from, let's say, from a 32 day when, when the, the broiler is ready to market? If you want to grow it bigger, you must understand that you need extra feed and, um, and spend extra money on feed to get more weight. So if it's worthwhile to have a bigger broiler um, that's heavier um, and you get more money for it, you can do your own basic calculation and just see how much feed you're going to use extra at what cost versus the benefit you'll get for uh, selling a bigger broiler. Um, the other thing that's happening as, as these broilers get, get older and older, uh, they get heavier um, and their body take more strain, so you might see an in increase in, in mortality. So if you don't manage that carefully, the older they get, the higher your, your losses is going to be in terms of mortality. So I think if you play within those, those boundaries, and consider, you know, when you want to start placing your, your new your new broilers and, and how many cycles you want to go through in a year or how often you want to turn over um, a, a cycle. That's the, the things you need to keep in mind when you, you want to understand when, when it's a good time to, to sell your, your broilers. I, I think, but obviously at the end of the day, your customer is going to detect um, what they're willing to pay for a certain um, size of broiler. Walter, any, any questions, uh, any um, remarks from you on this question? No, Stefan, I think you, you pretty much covered it. Um, it uh, obviously, like Stefan mentioned, the different factors, but maybe what you can do if you want to go look back um, in episode one, Martin was speaking about the different markets and what to look at. And then I think it was in episode three. Yeah, in episode three, Donnie and Sipo actually looked at the the different uh, profitability factors and all of those. And obviously, like Stefan said, your market's going to dictate what um, what bird they would like, but you need to dictate or you need to decide whether it's worth it, whether the amount of money that you're going to put in, you're going to get back um, from when you're selling the bird or a bigger bird. And because it does become more, more, um, more expensive and also less efficient as the birds get older and bigger. Um, but yeah, as Stefan mentioned, and um, then I just... Just on on a on a different point. Sorry, something I was thinking. I just saw Paul's question just now. Um, Stefan mentioned in the beginning about the the um, when to change your different diets. Um, I just need to mention as well what what I've seen with some of the guys is the fact that um, they often use a starter of one company and then a grower of another company and a finish of of for example one of those two companies because they 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 cheaper it works out cheaper to do it like that but in the end if you have to go work at your profitability it won't work out cheaper because it's a program that needs to be followed so all of what stefan said is relevant as long as you stick with the same feed company so if you you started with epol finish your cycle with epol um it is just better for your birds uh, well-being and growth and um, health and all of that to just stick with that uh, with that same feed company um, throughout the cycle. Um, yeah, but that's that's all for me. Thank you, Stefan. Thanks for that, Walter. I think that was our last question for today. Uh, just once again, thank you to everyone that's that's tuned in and that's given some of their time. Uh, to allow us to share our, our knowledge and our, our experience in terms of broiler farming. We would like to encourage you to, to st stay tuned for the rest of the series. Uh, please uh, follow our social media platforms um, and be on the lookout for further notifications around episodes coming up. I think it's a very good episode around um, the starter phase, so the brooding and the setup of your house and, the, and the f managing your house for the first few days next week. We've got a, a real-life broiler farming expert that's um, 
dann is, is hard work on, on the farms and, and grew through the ranks and, and now is um, working for COP as a breed company. So Tal Piri next week is going to tell you and give you first hand information about how to manage your broiler at the start of the cycle. Uh, once again, thank you to Walter and to you guys for, for, for tuning in. I hope you've got a bit of a better understanding about broiler nutrition and we've answered some of your, your questions and concerns. And looking forward to see you in, in following episodes. Um, thank you and take care. Bye.